This week's programme comes from the London School of Economics, where Professor Steve Keen talks to Newsnight's economics editor Paul Mason about how he saw the financial crisis coming. Good evening and welcome to the Old Theatre at the London School of Economics. I'm Paul Mason, here with a packed audience. In this week's edition of Analysis, I'll be talking to Steve Keen about his claim that if we keep the parasitic banking sector alive, the economy dies. Steve Keen is Professor of Economics and Finance at the University of Western Sydney in Australia and has a cult following among critics of mainstream economics. He was one of a small number of economists who put their reputations on the line before the collapse of Lehman Brothers and predicted there would be a major financial crisis. In his recently updated book, Debunking Economics, The Naked Emperor Dethroned, he argues that much of what is taught here at the LSE and other major institutions is, to put it politely, flawed. And not only flawed, but helped cause and accentuate the impact of the crash. Neoclassical economics, he says, with its naive, moneyless equilibrium theory of capitalism, provided the unwitting cover for the greatest Ponzi schemes in human history. Before we start, before we hear more about Mr Ponzi, let's get an idea of where the audience stands. If you agree with Steve Keen that the Emperor really does have no clothes, shout, start naked. Start naked! If you disagree with him and defend the current consensus, shout, fully clothed. Fully clothed! Thank you. So there's clearly the Steve Keen fan club here tonight. <laughs> Steve, welcome. Thank you. Look, we'll get on to your views about the banking sector in a bit, but first explain to us what you mean by neoclassical economics. OK, it's a theory of the economy which argues that it consists of utility maximising individuals and profit maximising firms. People who pursue their own interests. Yeah, who work together in a system that reaches ultimate harmony, where that harmony is, it means all prices in all markets reach equilibrium or tend towards equilibrium, and they model the economy as if it has no money, no banks and no debt. And for that reason, it had no idea that a crisis caused by banks lending too much money and creating too much debt was about to hit the world. To be clear, it's not that they ignore the existence of banks, they just think banks and debt and money are neutral to the workings of the system. They think you can model the macroeconomy without modelling either money or banks. And, and, and when you have a go at mainstream economics, that is the bit you're having a go at. Exactly. Well, we can't model the economy without the trio of banks, money and debt. If we have a model of macroeconomy that excludes any of those, we don't have a model of capitalism. And just explain to us why this huge swathe of professional economists ended up not realising the importance of banking and debt. What, where, how, did we, how did we get there? It starts from a vision that really persuades the students when they don't have enough exposure to money and debt that money and debt don't matter. They have saying, a lot of exposure in reality to money and debt. They do now. In particular, the latter. They do. But uh, what they, when they arrive as naive students at the university, they are given this little exercise to say, well, let's say, work out what your preferences are and work out what your income is and what relative prices are. We'll work out what you therefore consume given that information. And now let's double all prices and double your income. What happens? The answer is, oh, nothing. I still buy the same amount. They say, well, therefore, money is just a veil over barter. We can ignore the role of money in modelling capitalism and on we go. That is only true in a world without credit and a world without debt and a world without banks. We don't live on that planet. What's, what is wrong with tools that have worked, even if they only work, outside of a major once-in-a-hundred-year depression? What is wrong with tools that work 99% of the time? Well, if, if that was true, which it's not, uh, the one time you need them is during the depression. You need them to stop it happening, not cause it, and then say it was OK, it wasn't our fault. You know, we, we, worked, we worked out the good times. That was Bernanke's ridiculous excuse uh, after the crisis because they gave us the good times. Totally delusional. Sorry, totally delusional. You don't need economists to have an economy. You do need engineers to have a bridge. OK? Now, <laughs> if engineers built bridges the same way economists built the economy, there'd be so many crashes... We'd, re we'd reform the industry straight away. Economists can get away with it and bask in the glory of a false boom and congratulate themselves for causing it. No, it is true that in 2005, I think you, you did predict a coming debt-induced financial catastrophe. What was the moment that you realised this was going to happen? The time that I really consciously remember it, I was uh, with my then-wife in Perth. She was involved in the stage show of Dirty Dancing. 
and I was doing a, a um, yeah, I was doing a, uh, <laughs> I was doing a uh, expert witness report on predatory lending, and I wrote a th throwaway line uh, saying that debt to GDP ratios have been rising exponentially, and I knew as an expert witness rather than the barrister I couldn't get away with hyperbole. So I thought I'd better check this up. It won't quite be exponential. I need to modify the words, blah, blah, blah. I had to download the data. I had quarterly data for GDP, monthly for credit. And 2 o'clock in the morning, I plot it, and there was a pure exponential function. And I went, so holy hell. For the uninitiated, this is a graph that starts fairly flat, starts rising, and then rises up towards vertical. Yeah. Yep. And of, that, of debt to GDP. The ratio, not the level of debt, the ratio of debt to income. And I thought, holy hell, this has to stop at some point. When it does, the simple slowdown of the rate of growth will cause a recession. Somebody has to raise the alarm, and at least in Australia, I'm probably that somebody. Two o'clock in the morning, Perth, December 12th or so, night 2005. When Lehman Brothers went bust? I didn't predict that, by the way. Please. Okay. <laughs> uh, you would have had to see certain it's facts. Inevitable to see a credit crunch, like yep. I think one's going to hit England this year, but I wouldn't be able to say which firm is let's going talk to go. About, let's talk about that later. Mm. Uh, <laughs> But, but, but the question is, when Lehman Brothers went bust, yeah. did you then see the scale of the collapse that would happen? I, I was imagining a, probably a worse collapse than in fact occurred, because what I was really working with was the sheer, to me, macroeconomic, essential macroeconomic indicator of the ratio of debt to GDP. And that had hit levels, as I realised as time went on, I got more and more data, that the level of debt to GDP in America as the crisis began to break, was about one entire year's worth of GDP greater than it had been at the start of the Great Depression. And so looking at that, and I focused on the private sector level at all. I knew the government sector was bigger. I knew the government could ameliorate the downturn by deficit spending. But I focused just on the sheer scale of the private thing, and I thought this is going to be the biggest crunch in history. In fact, it ended up being smaller because of the sheer scale of the government reaction in the opposite direction. But what I always thought it would be, and it's turning out to be, is turning Japanese. Rather than being over in, in five or ten years of the Great Depression, courtesy of the Second World War as well, on for 20 years' worth unless we do something about it. Just briefly summarise for us the causes of the crisis. The fundamental cause of the crisis is the banking sector's profits are limited when they can only finance investment or consumption like you know, buying a house over time as a consumption item. They only make huge amounts of money by fooling us into Ponzi schemes, which they themselves don't and really Ponzi schemes yours. are like pyramid selling schemes. Gambling on rising prices. You buy money and, and play flip that house and think you can get wealthy by doing it. That's okay for an individual. We believe the entire society can get rich playing flip that house then all you're doing is accumulating debt, driving up house prices, getting more income for bankers, more income for real estate agents, and then ultimately the debt level reaches so high the society can't sustain it and we crash. What draws us down that route, though? We know bankers' individual behaviour can lead to yeah. that, but what, what is the objective and the system-wide well, thing that causes that? Well, first of all, this is one thing I've been trying to explain to Paul Krugman, I'm going to give up on it, obviously, is that money is endogenous. Money is created by the financial money system itself. Money is part of the financial money system. Money is not controlled by the central bank. Money is something which is generated by the private banking sector and there are really no effective constraints on the rate at which they can increase that. There are constraints on how fast they can do it, but they can't be stopped from creating money. What it requires, of course, is a willing borrower on the other side. Now, of course, when you get to the point where the willing borrowers disappear, then that capacity to create can be constrained, and we're seeing it now. It's falling down. But when they can persuade us that it's really smart to be in debt, then as that bubble goes, that actually causes the rising asset prices, which encourages more people in. It sets off the entire bubble. That's what gets us in. This is a financial business cycle. Why should it cause depressions? Because when you can't pay your debts, you can't eat. Everybody loves the guy who walks down Main Street with a credit card buying everything until he can't afford to get the credit card out anymore. And you build your own businesses based on this incredible demand brought by the person with a credit card, and suddenly... He can't get another credit card. He's not there anymore. And all the economic capacity you've built up to, to service that demand is suddenly excess and you go bankrupt. What was wrong with the policy once the crash had happened? Well, the policy once the crash had happened involved you know, throwing everything overboard, including Paul Samuelson. I mean, they talk about ditching everything. when the So Samuelson hit. is the doyen of Keynesian yeah. economics? Uh, no, please. Oh, the doyen of, of post well raising an economics. They call it Keynesian. I'm not going to let him get away with that well, one let, anymore. Let me, let, me, let me correct both of us then. He is, he is, he is the, 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 the father of modern academic economics. Exactly. Okay. Very true. And so they throw everything out of the window. Yeah. Why? 
Because they really saw total collapse staring them in the face. And, and of course, in this case, they were people who actually worked in the banking sector. I read Hank Paulson's uh, On the Brink, and he actually spoke about the point at which he realised that if he didn't get a huge amount of money to inject into the financial sector, then all these corporations were bankrupt. And he says at one stage, he said, I knew I had to say a large amount of money. I didn't dare say a trillion, because that would have caused total mayhem. But he said a really big number, and people said, what will happen if we don't get the money? And he said, may, something of the nature of, may God have mercy upon our souls. Now, that's the level of panic that existed inside the Politburo of America at the time. We've got a coherent vision here that is of excessive lending, mm. excessive borrowing, a policy framework designed to encourage it, mm. speculation at the top, on the froth, uh, as it were, on the top of it, and then a political elite that throws aside the theory and goes for numerous rescue plans. Yep. And it's still going wrong. It's, it is still out of control as far as you're concerned. Oh, yeah, and also at the same time, neoclassicals come out of the foxholes and now on their back putting their theories forward. I had my first exposure to this at a, a commercial seminar in Sydney where one of the other speakers had been flown out from the States and he started talking about reverse Ricardian equivalence. You want to explain that one? I don't want to explain it. <laughs> I, would, I would rather have a stiff gin than explain that. <laughs> Again, they're abusing Ricardo rather than, rather than Keynes in this one and claiming that somehow out of Ricardo they can drive the argument that if the government goes into austerity, that will stimulate the economy. Yeah. This, is, this is, in fact, a theory that we in Britain are quite, we, we are quite, we're quite familiar with uh, because although it has not been publicly exposed by the government, it is publicly exposed by, by some of their supporters in economics. Mm. I will take that as a, another moment to allow anybody in the audience who might want to chip in and make a point uh, contrary to what Professor Keane is making. Does anybody disagree with his, either his analysis of why it went wrong or, or the policy problems? Sir, up there in a black polo neck jumper. Uh, yeah, Dan Sofer. The danger with listening to you is it's sounding a little bit like an echo chamber. Why have you not had more success in engaging in dialogue here? Why has the doomsayer before the crisis not had more effect and not had more take up since the crisis proved you at least partially right? Well, it's a, a very good question. It, it's, it's the, there isn't a dialogue in economics. There's a dialogue of the deaf uh, because people like myself who are critics within academic economics have been screaming at these guys for ages saying you, you're going, go back you're going the wrong way if I can take a road you know a highway analogy, and they just completely ignore us. The, we're the loonies down the back of the corridor, the ones they can't get out of their department, but they just ignore them. And it'll be Austrians, Marxists, post Keynesians, you name it. There's always about one in 10, one in 15, 20 or so of each department's like that. So they ignored us all the way through. Now, when they actually, when the crisis has come along that they said couldn't happen, they're still trying to ignore us. But they simply dismiss us. As I think one of my friends explained to me this thing they call the area, what the air of, Paul, you better remind me here, the air of um, effortless superiority. Effortless superiority you know? It's Keen, Balliol College you're yeah, talking Keen about. Keane doesn't really understand all this stuff as well as the rest of us do. They don't even bother engaging. It's a tactic. That that's how they're engaging, by using effortless superiority. The trouble is what's happened, they said couldn't happen. And that's why I came out so loudly and say, you prove, you say I don't know your theories, your theories see the real situation we're in now can't happen. I think reality is on my side. Sir, in the middle. It's slightly fashionable to accuse banks of being the bad guys, when in actual fact the, the, the kind of philosophical core of the modern capitalistic economy, um, it's individuals acting in their own best interest, which is not equal to the best interests of society. Well, there's, there's, there's a, the, the real danger, the reason bankers identify bankers as a problem, is that the rest of us, when we act in our own interest. We face what Janos Kornai, a great Hungarian economist, called a hard budget constraint, generally speaking. We can borrow a bit, but we can't borrow indefinitely to finance what we do. Whereas banks are the ultimate generators of the soft budget constraint in capitalism. They can expand the money supply. They, it, it's a double entry bookkeeping exercise to expand the money supply. The way they make money is by persuading us to take on that debt. That's what bankers do. They persuade us that if we borrow money, which is bad, we can lever up the gains we make in asset prices, which is good, and make more money. So we take on more debt than we should. That's the leverage that actually generates the rising asset prices to begin with. That's why they're dangerous, because they can succumb to that. They're not bad people, but they've got an absolutely incredible temptation there, 
and they fall for it. And we get blacked onto it as well because we also, as individuals, make a gain out of that leverage. We have to remove that one massive flaw in capitalism to avoid perennial financial crises. But I mean, banks I, they, have rigid capital ratios, right? They have ceilings in terms of the amount of debt that they can create. It's most of those, I, I, I think it's more effective to model banks as if they are like a money lender in a, a, a peasant economy who says he's got a couple of big eunuchs protecting a huge box of gold and therefore you can trust what he writes on a piece of paper and nobody ever dares go towards the eunuchs to find there's no gold behind them. Fundamentally, banks manage to evade most of those controls, even the whole idea of using reserve controls. People talk about it still. They don't realise that America's reserve ratios only applies to household deposits, not corporate deposits. And less than 10% of the American money supply is subject to reserve controls. And the reserve controls themselves have about a 50-day lag after the loans and deposits are created. We see what is a control mechanism that actually is a response to what's happening in the private sector. Sir, here, at the front. Hello, my name is David Baxstein. I'm a banker. And uh, I move money around. <laughs> Earlier in my career, I actually did financial models uh, for derivatives and all of that stuff. So I guess I would be one of the bad guys in your theory. <laughs> one question. You were saying you predicted the crash in April 2005. Hmm. Did you short any assets? Did you recommend shorting any assets back then? <laughs> so the question is, Steve, did you uh, use your advanced knowledge to speculate on the downward price of any assets? No, I did, I did once a bit of a gamble and I thought it might happen in October of 2009, I think. My attitude was I'd, I put a bit of money but I could afford to lose it. And I got the timing wrong, the bubble continued. Timing is everything in a bubble. So, uh, so but I certainly warned a lot of people to get out of the, uh, out of the industry, so get out of the stock market before 2007. Lots of people did, and quite a few of them are, are very useful supporters of the work I'm doing now. So to the Steve Keen fan club, who are clearly here, he is fallible. You're listening to Analysis with me, Paul Mason, at the London School of Economics, interviewing the economist Professor Steve Keen. Now, Steve, what should we do to get ourselves out of this mess? What would you do? What I would do is what I call a modern debt jubilee, and that is we have to reduce the level of debt and reduce the wealth of the financial sector without penalising people who've purchased the goods that the financial sector spun off to them that they called assets or the loans they've, they've uh, the securitised. So what I would argue in favour of is what, it, what could be called quantitative easing for the public. So rather than Ben Bernanke giving the money to the banks and say, please lend, you give the money to the public and say, if you are in debt, you must pay your debt down. If you're not in debt, here's cash. What that would mean is the banks would then find themselves getting a lot of their loans paid off, their cash reserves would rise, their income earning components would fall, so they might be uh, illiquid rather than insolvent, so there'd be challenges there. People who had debt would have less debt, they could then spend more easily. People who had no debt would otherwise be penalised, would have a stack of cash out of which they could spend. The income earning capacity of the bonds they'd bought would fall drastically. They would have less income to spend out of, but much more cash. That would minimise the damage of making the transition, and it would reduce the power of the finance sector overnight. Now, that would also cause a lot of financial people to be unemployed. Tough. Would, would it not also bankrupt the middle classes of the Western world? That's because they, they, their pensions, above all, are linked to these financial assets. That's why I talk about giving a cash injection, that if you give the cash to the public and if you're not in debt, you have cash you can And where spend does this of. cash come from? Fiat money. Fiat money, so you print money. Well, yeah, Ben Bernanke hasn't tracked off. You create money. Yeah, you create money. Wouldn't it be less extreme to say, let's just go back to a system where banking serves industry? Oh, yeah, that's exactly... Is it, yeah. is that, but if you demolish banking, if you socialise it, as you would inevitably have to do, you're not going to get the, the, the crops. Well, no, you're not you going to get the Samsungs of you, this you, world. You don't socialise when you put something into receivership. We need people who have to know that what they've got to do is look at good ideas from capitalists distinguish them from the bad ones as best they can, and finance those. That's where the real growth to, comes from. Be, We'd have more Samsungs, more Apple iPods, I imagine, if we stopped bankers being able to make money by financing Ponzi schemes and said, if you want to make money, finance decent investment. Concrete policy. OK, suppose David Cameron rings you up, or George Osborne. They might. Mm. Uh, <laughs> they like heterodox economists. Uh, what do you tell them to do? 
Well, I'd go for the modern debt jubilee. So I certainly wouldn't write go, the debts down. I wouldn't go for austerity. So you, you, when you have the private sector deleveraging and reducing the level of money in the economy, you don't want the government doing the same thing at the same time. It's applying this household analogy, which actually leads us into crisis, because in a capitalist system there are two sources of money. The private sector can create it by creating debt. The government can create it by running a deficit. If you have the private sector deleveraging, so it's taking money out of the system and therefore reducing economic activity, if the government does it as well, you'll amplify the downturn. So I'd say your austerity program right now is the wrong way to go. And if states teeter on the edge of bankruptcy, I mean, Britain uh, was, was, wor was worried about its sovereign credit rating, yeah. what, what should they do? Go on spending? Yeah, fundamentally a country with its own sovereign currency can't go bankrupt when its debts are in that currency. The dilemmas in Greece are all because, uh, in, in, in Europe, because there's actually no country that owns the euro and therefore they can run out of it in that sense. What would you do for Greece then? Okay, they're in a different position. Suppose a Greek government comes to power that wants to do something different than uh, what the Commission is telling them. What would you advise them? Well, I, mean, what, I mean, this might be the prime candidate for your debt jubilee. They might have to actually write everything off. I, I think that's likely to happen. I think, think that we can believe that. I mean, there's the situation in, in Europe, and particularly in Greece, Spain, is dire. And I'm saying so dire that little blokes with moustaches can start popping up everywhere. We tend you to forget extremist that politicians. Hitler, gave, Hitler rose out of the crisis in Germany in the 1930s and a large part of why he got the, the, the worship of the German people was he actually went against conventional economic advice and ran a gigantic deficit funding the growth of the world's biggest war machine at the time and pushed it to full employment in the process. That demagoguery can rise in a situation like now. So to believe we're going to have political stability in the middle of the austerity being forced upon those people I think is naive. And at some point they'll come out and say the debts are over. I think that will probably happen. And you said we're in the middle of the crisis. Oh, no, I'd say about 30% through. 30% through. So there is more chaos on the way. Because the levels of private debt caused the crisis and they're only slowly being reduced. The American data I know best, and America's debt level peaked at 300% of GDP. That's private debt. So when we see Detroit recovering, when we see the housing market hovering at it, on the bottom of the curve, you don't think we, it's the beginning of the end of the crisis? No, it's, it's, we only get the crisis over when you get rid of the superfluous debt accumulated in the previous bubble. And we have so far to go on that process that it could take 10 to 15 years before that's worked out of the system. Questions? Sir? Kirk Economy, uh, former season. Do you think there's an internal inconsistency in what you're saying? Pouring money at it will just reinflate the bad investments and the bad ratings. So don't you think the focus should be on actually getting more focus on timely and accurate information so that the market can function properly? There, Something like that. There's certainly a role for the, for the market in giving uh, accurate valuations. The trouble is 99% of the activity on markets is speculative bubbles rather than actual information. I've got other proposals for the long term, not just the, the current period now, to reduce the extent to which that speculative overlay distorts the financial sector. And part of this comes from arguing that it's actually the acceleration in debt that causes rising ha asset prices. So I'm arguing in favour of redefining financial assets in such a way that that acceleration of debt won't drive the prices and you'll get a more realistic valuation. How would you, how would you redefine the financial assets? I'm talking about what I call jubilee shares for, yep. in the, and, and the pill in the property market. And Jubilee shares are the suggestion that shares would continue to exist as they do now. These are shares in corporations. Shares in corporations. If you bought a share of a company in an IPO or an issue of shares by the company, they last no change, exactly the same as they are now. You could sell those shares a set number of times. So you get some price discovery, say seven times. I'm using biblical numbers here. Okay. <laughs> Once the seventh sale had taken place, the share would last 50 years and expire. Therefore, so you would cut out a large part of the secondary market. You'd still have our primary price discovery. You're repressing the stock market as it exists yeah. today as yeah. a potential vehicle for speculation. Because what actually drives the price up is people then borrowing money to take advantage of that. Okay. And that's what actually gives the price bubbles. Now, if you make it absolutely lunacy to borrow money to buy a share which is going to expire in 50 years, you'll get less leverage in the asset market. Steve, the critics will say this is not a very dynamic model of capitalism. We have dynamism because we have speculation, because we have uh, animal spirits. We have dynamism because engineers <coughs> speculate, not because financiers do. Capitalism was far more dynamic back in the days when engineers dominated back in the 1950s. And we need to get back to that world where the financiers are the servants of the engineers, not the masters. Sir at the back. Uh, Carl Gombridge, related to the idea of dynamism, I want to just focus on this country and the analogy with Japan. And so I just want to question whether 
Firstly, we could be like Japan for, say, 10, 15 years. And secondly, if it would really be that bad, particularly if we redistributed some of the wealth to the people who are suffering in the current mm. situation, why can't we just go on with 0.1% growth or indeed 0.1% recession for 10 years? Why would that be a problem? Well, then Japan continued developing industry until 1990, and it still has it. There's been far more industrial development in Japan than there's been in Britain. You guys are specialised in the biggest Ponzi scheme on the planet. Uh, so you have a much more difficult transition to get to that sort of productive malaise that Japan is still in. So I think you could certainly... It, it won't be as, as bad as the Great Depression was, but it will be a continuous state of depression where you fall back into it, back out of it, back into it, back out of it, without the social cohesion of Japan and without the industrial base. And with, I think by the looks of it, actually a far higher level of private debt and far more financial speculation. So it's, it's a difficult road for Britain to get to be Japan. You did say, and we did say, you might address this issue of a debt bubble in Britain. Yeah. You, well, this might be a good time for you to address that. The level of debt England's taken on is breathtaking. I thought America was bad when it had a total private debt ratio of 300% of GDP. Even the Treasury's figures here have you at 450% of GDP. And whereas America's financial sector debt peaked at 120% of GDP, yours is 250%. And at various times in the last three or four years, something like 60% of aggregate demand in the economy has come from rising debt. Now, turning that around is going to be painful, and I really believe... I, just, I can't see you avoiding a credit crunch at some stage that probably will be of the scale of Lerman Brothers. Again, in Britain? Yeah. I hope I'm wrong, but looking at those numbers, the only reason you've managed not to go down as fast as the Americans have is you've bounced up and down in changing debt levels. It's, it's really quite intriguing to look at a graph of adding the change in debt to GDP in America and where it went from really high to positive to really increasing demand to cutting it. Looking at England, it bounces around all the way along the top, but it's one and a half times as high and twice or three times as volatile. When it starts to go negative, all the hot money that gave you what looked like a prosperous economy for the last 20 years will be out the exits to Kuwait and wherever else the mafia lives, and I think you'll find a bit of a credit crunch coming your way. There's no suggestion, of course, that the mafia live in Kuwait. Uh... <laughs> We will be sleeping with the fishes of the Persian Gulf if we suggest that. <laughs> All that remains for me, Paul Mason, to say is thank you to Steve Keane and the audience at the London School of Economics. Analysis was presented by Newsnight's economics editor, Paul Mason, and produced by Kavita Puri. For more information about our terms and conditions, please go to the Radio 4 website.